I think it comes from trying to like logically work out like what happens to the human experience after death. And the logical thing is like nothing. That's the end of the human experience. But this isn't like this isn't a, this isn't a good attitude because then ultimately you end up with well, you know, what does science and modernism have to tell you? Science and modernism only has to tell you like ah, oh, medicine had been a bit better, they wouldn't have died. So the only thing death ultimately is just a failure. It's just like ah, oh, they should have been safe. Like this is it is a medical condition that one day we will be able to cure like every other medical condition. And so ultimately all there is is tragedy because the system has fucked up because this person should have not died and said he died. There's like hair, <laughs> hair editing. Yeah, there's hair software. You can, yeah. <laughs> well, okay, you can figure that out. I've hit record. So, um, hello, yeah. everybody. Welcome to quite a, uh, a special episode of Techno Social. So, people who've been listening for some time or have listened to some of the older episodes might know that there was uh, Dylan was part of it initially. My uh, my good Canadian friend who I mean I've known for years and years and years and years and. We did some uh, some of our kind of like bigger interviews with Dylan, like with uh, Ian McGilchrist and uh, with John Viveki. But uh, then then Dylan made the decision to actually go off and live in Canada around about September 2019 and was out there and pretty much ended up living in the forest the entire yes. time that the, uh, the COVID pandemic was hitting. So now he's back in civilization from this uh, this wild journey and basically having a conversation to a introduce him to Daniel and bring him back into the sphere of techno social, but also just to kind of catch up and find out like what the fuck that was like living in the forest during the pandemic. So uh, over to you, Dylan. Um, yeah, I guess I'm glad to be back. Uh, it's good to see you, Owen, and hello, Daniel. Uh, nice to finally meet you as well. Um, yeah, I had a, honestly, I had a bit of a midlife crisis. Um, my boss wouldn't my boss wouldn't let me pour myself a beer after a shift at the pub and so i calmly and reasonably without having a giant argument with my boss made the decision to quit which was definitely also a decision i had thought through and decided to move to canada and i moved to whistler in canada and um i basically just became a ski bum, which is where you just sort of work for money to pay your ridiculous rent and then go skiing or snowboarding. Um, and that's why I wasn't really in many, many techno socials after the September of two years ago, I think it was, or actually a year, well, September of 2019. So yeah, I kind of dipped and then and then coronavirus happened and coronavirus kind of killed the whole skiing industry in March of, well, February of uh, 2019. So me and everyone I knew lost our jobs and everyone, all the Australians in Whistler had to go back to Australia. And because I'm a Canadian citizen, uh, the UK government advice was actually stay in Canada. And me and a friend of mine ended up deciding that we were going to get jobs pre-planting, which is... Um, that's a whole topic I'd have to go into in, in itself, but we had a couple of weeks until that job started. So we decided like, you know what, screw it. We don't want to pay rent in Whistler because it's just it's way too much. It's too expensive. We're gonna, um, my mate had his car set up to sort of live in, but it was just like a mattress in the back. And so I was like, screw it, I'll buy a tent and let's just drive around BC for what ended up being about a month and a half, I think like seven weeks. Um, and effectively, like we, we, we hadn't really thought it through that much. We only we thought it would only be like a week or two that we would be essentially just living in like the backwoods of just like British Columbia and Canada in the mountains. But it ended up turning into a month and a half during like right at the start of the lockdown. And yeah, I we basically became hillbillies. Um, and it was honestly, it was it was a lot of fun. It was great. It was a. Uh, I think it was probably one of the most random and interesting things I've done in my life. 
It was in a lot of ways uneventful, though, because like you just settle into sort of living in the woods, wake up, go fishing, play cards, cook some food. You just go to sleep in the woods. And then I went tree planting, which is also in the woods and also in a tent. So I ended up living in a tent for about nine months in total this year, which... Like, I guess one of the interesting things that like emerges to me is like, did you get a sense of like, did that transform like how you were perceiving the world at all? Um, <clears throat> um, I would say it did, but it like not immediately because at first we, it was like, we're just camping. And it was only after sort of about a month in the woods that you realize you've sort of picked up all these habits that anyone in a city would think were incredibly weird. And the obvious one is that at a point, again, like I kind of realized this and then only like weeks later did I realize I had realized this, that I actually be like, wait a minute, a very bizarre way to think. So the, the most obvious one is the realization that dirt is clean. Like the dirt on the floor, that's actually like in the grand scheme of things, that's pretty clean. Like, in a city, when you have showers, it's like any anything that is on your body, it's not clean. Yeah. Whereas in the wilderness, you get something weird and sticky on you when you're walking. It's like, well, this is weird and sticky. The dirt is pro- is is more clean than the weird sticky thing. So you pick up some dirt and you rub the dirt on the stickiness until it goes away. Now you've got dirt on you, but dirt is fine. Like. So it's sort of in a lot of low level ways, it sort of changes your perception of things in terms of like sort of like your habits and your attitude towards a lot of the sort of more basic aspects of the world around you. Um, You also sort of lose any conception of like the indoors, which is weird when you live in a tent. Like if you're getting rained on, like you're getting rained on. And that's kind of that. And if you're in your tent, you might be more dry, but you're not going to be that dry unless you've got a really, really good tent. And so like you also just, you embrace just being damp and all these things just stop bothering you. And then insects just stop bothering you. It's just part of life. And so you, I think, I think while I was in the wilderness, I definitely like sort of everything around you just, just it, it becomes a lot more sort of routine despite being so completely different from what you're used to. But I can also say that when you come back to a city, you very quickly become accustomed again to um, all the nice kind of amenities of not having to dig a hole when you go to the toilet and um, being actually able to have a shower whenever you want. How much access did you have to communication and to knowledge about what's happening in the world? Um, usually where we were camping, there was no telephone signal. So if we didn't go like drive to like the nearest town to like, we would buy most of our food because supermarkets were still open and we had money and like gathering your own food is another level. You need to, if you want to actually gather enough food to live off of, you need to, you need to know what you're doing. You need to be experienced at like hunting and fishing and foraging. And unfortunately we weren't that wild, but we, we go into town like once or twice a week to buy food. And, or sometimes we'd move campsite and we'd just be driving through somewhere and we'd get data. But like, yeah, we could go a week with like, no, just idea of what's going on in the world. And then come out of the woods and be like, Oh, Hey, like coronavirus is either way worse or way better or like this or that is going down. So, um, like all, all that stuff that goes on in the world is, is all of a sudden, it's like, whatever. It's mm-hmm. so like distant. It has no effect on your life. Like, whereas something like the weather is like, that's way more important. Like the moment we'd have data, first thing, what, what's the weather like? Because that's going to, like, that is going to absolutely dictate to you, like what the next few days are going to be like and what you're going to do in those days. Because if there's like a day of hard rain, then knowing that that's going to happen is really good because you can like actually prepare for it and make sure your tops and stuff are all ready. And then furthermore, like that's going to dictate what you do in those days. Like you're not going to be going out and like 
fishing much. You're not going to be like doing any hikes or anything like that. Mm. Oh, I think uh, we just lost Owen. Oh, uh, but we, it's, it's all right. He'll, he'll probably jump back in at some point. Um, this was what, like March, April? Yeah, March. April. Yeah. So how was the weather? Um, so British Columbia is pretty famous for rain mm. and that, that is basically like it's you, you, your conception of weather in the, up until the summer, it's basically it's raining or it's not raining. And if it's not raining, that's great and amazing. And if it's raining, it's like, well, now I am just permanently damp until this stops, <laughs> which is, um, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think it provides a bit of an insight also into sort of like how, how stuff like how, how animals even think about the world insofar as that, like, you know, the primary issues in their lives are these kind of brand brand, like, I don't know, effectors that they have no understanding or control over. It just comes down on you and it's like, right, you have to adapt your existence to this set of conditions, for example, it's raining. Or even in the summer, it started getting really, really sunny uh, while we were tree planting. And that also, it's like, especially if you don't have something like, a, like if you don't have water or access to water, that has a huge effect again on like what you're even going to be able to do with your day because it's mad sunny and dusty and there's no water like you know, you're actually kind of a risk if you decide you want to go for a jog or something like that. Mad. That, 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 that makes me think about how, you know, if you remove all the modern amenities, that there's sort of an autopilot underneath that of hmm. things that do have an order, do, have the, you know, remove all modernity, there's something underneath that. And that underneath that has a shape, has a way to be. There are things that need to be taken care of, like water, food, shelter, and, and the basics. They are not sort of tabula rasa. They exist. They, they have a way. There's a proper way to engage with it. In other words, if you didn't do your stuff properly and there's one way to do it properly, you know, you'd starve, you'd be super wet. and so there is such a thing as a proper baseline underneath all of that. Yeah, definitely. And um, I think one of the big contrasts is that I think in civilization, we have all these things sorted out and it's just permanent. And, and in a way, we spend a lot of our time trying to find stuff to do. Whereas one thing in nature is that like ultimately your tent can always be a bit better set up. Your tops can always be a bit better angled to deflect the rain. There's, there's always sort of something that you can go and do that occupies your time that is part of sort of just like staying alive and keeping all your stuff like organized in a way that you aren't going to get annihilated by like some kind of natural force essentially. And so that means that like, in nature, you're kind of never bored. Like there's always sort of more things that you could be doing to be like better set up for life. Whereas in civilization, we've kind of got everything so well set up to life that I find myself way more susceptible to boredom now that I'm not like in the woods. <laughs> it's boredom. like outcome of the division of labor, right? It's like once we become settled and become agricultural and urban the functions necessary to sustain life are divided into specialist groups and then once they've got those sorted then new higher order specialist groups can get created like <laughs> data scientists but <laughs> You drill down to it, you go out into the wilderness. And like this is why I find it so fascinating, Dylan. I think it's it's quite a rare experience for for people in in our day and age to spend more than like a few days a week on like a, a camping trip. And even then you've like you kind of like indicate yourself you would go into the shops to buy food. It's like not going completely wild i mean there's almost this question of it's like how possible would it be for someone of a like the, with the consciousness of our age to go fully wild I to even they, know 
those baseline skills, survival, eating, safe sanitation to an extent that long-term wilderness life would be possible. I think very, very few people in the world compared to the total population of the world have even a portion of those skills. Like if you think about all the people who live in London, how many of them have even been hunting? Like I actually haven't been hunting, so. Plus there's always that difference like where's the line that defines the difference between civilization and wilderness right Mm. you know what's the most natural thing in your room it's probably you um but that might mean is that nature um it's kind of our artificial social construct because Mm. you know to look at agriculture if if imagine civilization breaks down tomorrow first thing i'll do is i'll try to do some agriculture and that's a technology it's not so, so, you know, where does, where does wilderness and nature start? Is it the dawn of civilization and agriculture? Do you want to put that line 100, 100,000 years before that? 200,000 years before that? So that's a hard one. And that's why, you know, it's kind of this co- co-evolution. The only tradition is the one that we exist in right now, or at least that's how I'd relate to the idea of the state of nature with this i you know i think there was i forget the name now but there was this philosopher who was uh who used to talk about the noble savage and this idea that you could you know now we're too it's modern. Rousseau, right? yeah something like that and the oh that, that there's a noble savage with a tabula rasa and that's the pure thing and we're just degenerates it's like no dude um <laughs> come on we survived because someone invented like invented a way to cultivate potatoes ergo the population managed to explode and that's why we are here so you know where there's no disconnection between technology and ourselves right yeah i think like i mean unless you like in terms of really the divide between civilization and nature like it, it's actually the just the divide between humans and absence of humans like what there's like wherever there are humans, we apply some kind of modification to our environment in order to exist. Like outside of like the savanna of Kenya, and even there, like, you know, humans cannot live in even like somewhere like Italy. They wouldn't survive a winter without shelter and without like clothing and without fire. And so, you know, ultimately, in terms of like fully escaping civilization, you know, in a way, humans are civilization. There's, there's always use of technology going on. And even if you remove all the technology that you know, you're actually just going to come up with new technology because that's yep. how stuff happens. It's like chopping off an, a hand. It's like, no, it's part of our body. It's part of like how we are and who we are. Um, yeah. You know. But then at the same time, I think there is a contrast to be made between sort of like, I think I think the word is like, holistic or I don't know there's some word between like the 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 way the sort of methods of human existence that involve like aggressively removing the pre-existing natural environment and replacing it with our own preferred environment and sort of not necessarily like literally sweeping away mm-hmm. the um like basically the the ecology mm-hmm. and, and there's i mean ultimately this is like subsistence existence it's not it's not possible to sustain a city of like you know 12 million people without yes annihilating annihilating the pre-existing stuff <laughs> yeah but there are modes of life ways of living people out there that that involve kind of being more a feature of the landscape than mm-hmm the landscape so interesting that reminds me like this one time i was hearing or reading about how there was this thing called calories per square meter or per square kilometer and um, in china because they had rice and the rivers there would flood regularly they could have like two or three crops a year of rice which would produce a lot of calories many many more calories per acre than you know even mesopotamia or europe until the advent of the potato and what that created was like a civilization that 
you know, you have a lot more people, therefore you have to create different ways to govern. And so their culture evolved in that way. So some people say that Europe is the culture of wheat and China is the culture of rice and that that has implications on the personality of people and the philosophies and the governments and the religions. It's pretty cool if you think about it, because it's like you say, it's tied to how people subsist mm. and how they feed themselves. Mm. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it would be almost bizarre to think of a culture like how you produce food is ultimately the most defining aspect of human existence. And up until like the 19 sort of 50s, when the majority of the population was no longer involved in farming, and even then, it's mm. sort of fundamental to a society. So I think, I think it's it's inevitable that the methods of producing food would have an imprint on the culture that they were part of. I guess maybe part of it is that like, or an example of that might be that sort of with the with the amount, with the intensity of rice farming, the very, like it's calories per acre, it's the best, but in, in, in terms of labor, it's a very labor intense crop. It requires a lot more like work in terms of days of the year to produce those calories per acre. And maybe that, that has an effect on like, for that you need a deeper and more intense system of social organization than say wheat, or actually like half the year, the farmers can kind of sit around and do other stuff. And therefore they end up being a bit more independently minded than in a culture where it's like, no, 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 we have to, we have to work constantly in order to produce enough food so people don't starve. Mm -hmm. And there's more of us. It's cool. So maybe there's no Confucius if there wasn't any rice. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it it makes a lot of sense that Mm. his emphasis on duty in a society where to sustain the population, more work is necessary. So, so the artificial general, general intelligence of the future that's, that's going to emerge out of China, uh, fed off of rice in its infancy, or rather it was the farming of rice, rice in its infancy. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think... I tell you what it's like, got me thinking of now, and apologies, is my connection going to utter shit at the moment. So if it's horrendous, <laughs> please just shout at me and I'll stop talking. But it's like, so I was just editing the conversation that uh, Daniel and I had with our friends, Cadell Last and Raven Connolly the other day. And we were talking about the transition from feudalism into capitalism and then kind of speculating on the transition from capitalism into question mark. And there's this sense that, up until the industrial revolution, pretty much the most important dynamic for how humans structured their social relations was the production of food. Most people were peasants living in big feudal estates. And then we have industrial revolution and we kind of come up with industrial farming techniques like enclosure, increased machinery, which eventually leads, of course, into the era of like factory farming and genetically modified crap crops. Essentially, we don't do away with the basic structuring function of human relations. We just find a way to um, find a way to industrialize it. So now there's this question of if in the industrial capital era, capital is what structures human relations, the the ability of people to negotiate between one another and exchange their labor time in, in return for this abstraction, and then that abstraction buys you access to other people's labor time products of their labor is there a way in which we don't get rid of capital but there's a kind of industrialization of capital in the same way that we manage to factory farm and genetically modify um, food is there a like a the equivalent of a factory farmed capital and one speculative answer to that is like well that's kind of what we do with quantitative easing right we just bring a load of money out of nowhere the issue, of course, is that it has um, implications for how a currency can can kind of stay stable versus just being massively devalued. But I wonder if there's some kind of like nifty new techniques within this space. Sort of sounds what you're saying definitely reminds me of it. Not directly, but indirectly, sounds a bit like a universal basic income. Insofar as like 
you know, we're talking about moving from a sort of, in, in the same way that our society became sort of capital intensive, but food stopped being an issue insofar as like, especially now, like it's, it's not, like the vast majority of the population don't actually have to sit down and think like, am I going to have enough to eat? But they do think like, am I going to be able to pay the rent? Um, <clears throat> or at least the effect that that has on their lives. In the same sense, might we sort of move to a, okay, well, actually these things like rent and this stuff are cheap enough or easy enough to acquire that that's no longer the great sort of source of stress and that something else supersedes capital because capital is just freely available or at least capital is easy enough to acquire in the same way that nowadays food is easy enough to acquire. My fear about the basic income, like I was, I was reading a, a paper or like an article the other day written by a, a journalist who, who studies Silicon Valley and in particular who knows a lot of the Silicon Valley elite. And he surveyed them over a few years, basically on their worldview. Mm -hmm. And most of them, what he thought, most of them had this worldview that basically what we want the future to look like is like universal basic income and then an incredibly strong meritocracy where essentially a few smart people rise up and join the big tech companies and solve all the problems and then everybody else is on a basic income to keep them alive. Now that's perhaps a, a simplification of it, but there's something that really turns me off about that view. Like what I think that is that the inverse of the basic income is that like it's a great way for a small power group to absolutely consolidate their hold on power because yeah. it's 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 the bread and circuses effect essentially. Like you could already there's a case to be made that the reason why radical political change is so difficult in the later 20th century and the 21st century is because actually capitalism found a way to make life bearable enough and sedating enough to prevent anybody from really rebelling against it. Mm. And the universal basic income almost seems like a, a well-meaning extension of that logic. And I can't help myself combining that with say like a picture of, high quality virtual reality, Netflix, video games, and porn. And it's like a, an amazing virtual world for everybody. And then the tiny Silicon Valley elite can dominate it and kind of do what they like with it. I don't think I want to live in that world. Perhaps because I don't seem a, a way in for myself into the tech elite. Yeah, it almost strikes me that in such a world, especially if virtual reality becomes like widespread and commonly used in a similar way to say Facebook and Twitter and um, Instagram, that in such a world, whoever's in control of that virtual reality is a God. Like it's not even, it's not just about like having power over people's lives. It's like you decide like not just general stuff about the world people live in, but you can create and destroy everything on a whim. You have, you have like so much, you know, if we, you have the ability to, to literally create places, to literally create kingdoms and empires and houses and everything for people to live in in this virtual reality, and you ultimately have control, Whoever's, whoever would be at the top of that. I think it'll make way for the ultimate despotism, which also sounds like the boy pharaoh or philosopher king type fantasy, which doesn't seem really sustainable in the long run, right? Um, so that's that's what comes to mind when you have such a centralization of power, you know, along with the universal basic income. They'll probably give us a universal. Netflix subscription and, and all of these other sort of ways to control and say what's what's basic, what's income, right? The more you have, the more you want to have. And so the hunger will never be satisfied. Mm. And like, <clears throat> I think, honestly, I think that that's actually like maybe where we're headed in the near term. I think that the, this specific vision, like, you know, you say that that's, this is what's, 
this is what the people in Silicon Valley actually think when surveyed. I think there is going to be a serious attempt to create something like this in the fairly near term. Like Facebook has bought Oculus Rift because they think virtual reality is the future of social media. So it's sort of a big, a big question is like, will, will society accept this? Like if, will, you know, if, if it is sort of brought into the world, the idea of a mostly virtual existence, will, is that something that people will pick up? I think we've already accepted it. We already have a very virtual existence. It's just low bandwidth. Mm. I mean, this is the point that Elon Musk makes again and again. It's like we're already cyborgs. We just the bandwidth is limited to how quick your two thumbs can move or your fingertips can move. And I think the pandemic has only accelerated it. It's like life is done via Zoom now. Mm. Plus, um, the thing that virtual reality actually implies is, or teaches us, I would say, is that all reality is virtual and designable if you parametrize it properly. So. Why draw the limit of real and virtual at the edge of the lens of the headset? Perhaps if you take that limit and throw it into the world, you'll realize that so many of the social conventions and discourses and all of that are actually obviously also virtual and constructs, which is which sounds a little bit scary because, oh my God, everything is just made up. But on the other hand, it also sounds exciting because, well, if it's made up, you can also make it up yourself. And there's also something to be said about the fact that we do need these um, constructs. So the, I agree with you. It's, it's, it's coming, the increasing invasion of this power space by technology, right? Whether Silicon Valley or someone else, you know, as long as someone can make a buck out of inventing reality, it's going to happen. And so that's kind of the invasion of techno capitalism to everything. But then there's also the positive or not so scary aspect that, well, yeah, okay, then then how do we how do we interact? How do we adapt to this to this different paradigm where everything is so liquid, so virtual, so designable? Mm. Something like that. I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there when you said that, like we already have somewhat virtual social construct in the real world, but everyone is kind of part of them in the real world. Like they're, they exist as a result, they exist in the collective consciousness as you're a part of and people, you know, old social constructs, you know, die and new ones live because the population as a whole accepts or rejects them over time. So it's a, it's a participatory system. Like even something like the Chinese communist party like they might back it up with like force of arms. They might like shoot protesters, but it's still a social construct. It's still dependent on the willingness of the soldiers to take orders. It's still depending this on, depends on like not enough people openly opposing the regime that, you know, the only like way to sustain the regime would be civil war as happened in Syria. So like there is a, there is always a participatory element of sort of the social constructs and the sort of virtual concepts we have in the real world. Whereas I think the thing in virtual reality would be that you, you would lose that, that sort of a, you could either like become your own little God and isolate yourself or b you might become dependent on a reality that is, is entirely, not just abstractly, but entirely under someone else's control and your, your dependence is not moderated by the sort of necessity of your participation as it is in the mm. real world. Whereas in the online world, it's like you would have just a dependence and no, no sort of yeah. back. It's not a system you reinforce, it exists. Dependent on it or not. Indeed, it's kind of a, that's the danger of this last chapter. It's, that's different than all the other ones. You made me think about something though, which is, it is as if nature has this fail safe for these regimes that we try to impose, which is the fact that generations die and new ones are born. And the way that's a regime adapts to one will not be the same way that that regime adapts to the latter. Furthermore, the speed at which these regimes come and go and come and evolve and, and come and go only accelerates. 
So whereas before you managed to have, you know, 10, 20, 50 generations living under kingship, in, it, it evolved kind of slowly. And I'm talking about Europe. You know, the 20th century, you had countries with three or four different regimes in under 100 years. And now we're coming into this, this fourth one, this fourth industrial revolution, which is kind of the, the new one, the, the, the one that's coming in here. And yeah, the fact that generations comes, come and go can be like a checks and balances, right? Checks and balances yeah. to the universality of these regimes to last forever. Because it's hard to keep a regime alive forever. Yeah, people, uh, people lose faith at a point. There was a good point in a book I recently read that I completely forgotten the name of because it has a name that you would never guess the topic. But the topic is sort of like basically why the Soviet Union failed. And sort of the deepest, most fundamental point, he says, is that the Soviets thought their job, their reason for existing was to educate the proletariat and make all the proletariat into good communists. And once everyone's a good communist, we'll have communism, it'll be perfect, and the Soviet state will wither away. And the point he basically makes is that when someone has lived under capitalism, and the capitalism was bad, and then they live under communism, all the communism has to be is less bad than capitalism. And that person is going to be like, okay, well, the system isn't perfect, but it's an improvement. But then when you have a generation that has grown up knowing nothing other than communism, Ultimately, they have no experiential knowledge of alternative systems. And so the only thing you actually teach them is why the current system doesn't work, because all they ever experience is the flaws in the existing system rather than the comparison of that to something else, because there's never anything else to them. You, you, know, you can tell them about it, but they're never going to go and see it. So, And then the obvious irony, of course, is that when they did go and see it, they realized they were being lied to. Um, but so really, the only thing that these dictatorships that claim to have happened upon this amazing, self-sustaining, perfect system that's going to solve all the problems, like the only thing they end up teaching their population is why that system is bad. Like, they end up just educating everyone. Everyone becomes incredibly well-educated in the flaws of the system because they live in it until they experience those flaws on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think this all feeds in to sort of something tangential, but also to do with like a sort of technology that people are really thinking about seriously now is immortality. Is human immortality possible either in the form of just sufficiently perfected medicine that you can medically avoid death or taking someone's consciousness and just pouring it into a computer? And honestly, I think that would be sort of the pinnacle of this virtual, of the, 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 what the pinnacle of the movement of sort of human existence into the virtual would also be immortality in the virtual. And that might be one of the most dangerous things is that because once you have immortality, this process that you outlined of like constant change based on the fact that old people die and new people get made, like this will stop and we will have immortals. And in the virtual reality, they will be as gods. And I think that's a, that's a very scary prospect. The idea of like the immortal elite who own the reality. I think whether whether that is <clears throat> feasible practically or not, I don't know. It, it, it overlaps, in my view, the search for immortality with artificial general intelligence and all these things kind of overlap in this desire for absolute power that you would hear off of a 90s cartoon villain. Mm. And what I think they symbolize, even if whether achievable or not, as an idea that people have and that are as widespread, they point towards this lust for uh, absolute ultimate power. It's very Platonist. It's very boy Pharaoh like. It's very, you know, we've solved the world, manitizing the eschaton. It's like, you know, check. We've 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 got that. <laughs> we've achieved it. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. That also sounds extremely. It's going to be short-lived. It's going to probably be bloody. It's, it's going to be very dangerous. Sounds when you create immortality, you also immortalize all of the fucking shit and the problems and the social conflicts that exist between the, the subjects that become immortal. Yeah. Like the, the, the next generation, they learn from what their parents do and also see the, see the flaws. There's some kind of, 
reaction against it and the reaction brings a whole swathe of its own problems but it's also in some sense the dialectical process at work it's like you take the generation of the second world war the 1940s and 50s and they came back and they were like well we just want to live like a fucking stable life and quite a conformist life. And I wonder how much of that was also influenced by the fact that they were used to wearing military uniforms. Right. And then they had the next generation who were the children of the sixties who go totally the other way. And they're like, no, we don't want war. We want free love. We want psychedelics. We want, we, we want a very different liberal worldview. And in some sense, it's like that only emerges from, from as a reaction against the very like kind of rigid perhaps militaristic world of their parents and then we now kind of <laughs> we swing back against that and it's kind of tricky to say where we're, well where we're at now we've got like a very um quite a mainstream left-wing movement in kind of like wokeism but now there's also a kind of like online conservative counterculture moving against it which is perhaps not even cross-generational here but it's like it's it certainly like splits the young demographic, the millennial, and perhaps the the like post millennial demographic. But so so like it, what I'm getting at, it's like the immortalization of the social conflict is in a sense the kind of the end of history. Hey. And, and it, I think this is the paradoxical thing about a lot of like about Hegelian thought and then also Marxist thought. It's like we think in dialectics, but then we both also have the fantasy. Like Hegel's like, right, I've got the system. Now it's the end. And Marx is like, yeah, it's dialectical materialism up till communism. And then it stops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of, I think it's just, it's, it's tempting to think that there is a possible solution to all of the questions that we have. And ultimately, I think the scientific perspective, or more specifically, like, how there, there is sort of a big question in science. And I think the answer to that question is also the answer to this kind of like question is that in science, how can you ever describe your scientific discovery as true? Because Newton came up with his whole system of maths for describing and predicting how objects behave according to forces and this and that. And that, seemed like, there you go, you've solved the problem. That's great. We now know how all the forces and objects behave, which until, of course, subatomic particles and atoms were discovered that behaved in a completely different way. And then we, like, came up, you know, we, we came up with new theories, with thermodynamics, with nuclear physics, and then, like, you know, eventually we found quantum particles that started behaving in really new weird ways. And so we had to come up with new theories. And then it's like, wait, so like, was that Einstein's theory? Like, was it true? Like, was that the truth? Can we sit down and say that that's the truth? And it's like, not really, to be honest, because we now know that all those things he would describe doing were actually made of smaller things that behave according to a whole different set of rules. But in a way it was kind of like an answer to that specific question but the answer to that question created new questions because ultimately there were things that didn't fit that model and demanded a new model. And this is like a, this is just forever. There was, unless you like Einstein proposed, you know, unified field theory, which was meant to be like, we're going to explain all of physics, hundred percent, everything, one model, everything. We've never found it. We've never made it. It's not, it's not been created. And some people think it might be, but it hasn't. And so I, I kind of think this is sort of an example of the same thing. It's like you can look at all the problems we have and come up with all the solutions, but that, you know the only reason that you might think that that's the end of history is because you fail to imagine that there might be a new problem, there might be a different problem, that something something that is not now might come into being. And if you instead keep in mind, like actually the solutions to the problems will create their own set of problems. You know, it's you, you, I, I, to me, it seems like really we should abandon any kind of sort of end of history thinking, any kind of like, let's find the one golden utopia where all the problems are solved. Because actually, even if you could create that, you just end up having another set of problems which would need another set of solutions. Like, the fall never ends. 
movement mm-hmm. is yeah it's like you said you solve a thing and then something else comes along so yeah this eternally mobilistic thing that's what bard calls mobilism i think uh, and it's something that's transversal to the sciences to history to politics to people's lives mm. so indeed it never stops Mm. That's why Lewis talks about a philosophy of becoming. And that's also why there's a card in the tarot called the wheel, which is something that never stops spinning. That's why so many popular songs even are about wheels turning because it's, you know, it is what it is. It's eternal nomadism. Even Mm. if you stop for a little bit here and there, it doesn't, uh, entropy never stops. The only constant is change. But there's a type of consciousness that wants that stop, that like fantasizes about bringing about the end of history, about mm-hmm. being the one who solves all of the problems and solves all of the problems. Like that's even Einstein's statement when he's like, we're going to have unified th- field theory and then we've solved it all. Because the thing is you need to postulate that symbol, that idea in order to move and move is what you need to do. And so you need to have a symbol of perfection towards which to move, but you never reach the North Star. There's no such thing mm. other than a, a cog in the wheel, the cog that's outside of the machine, but, but you need to postulate it in order to move. Otherwise, there's no direction. But that doesn't mean that it is reachable. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a bit it's of a... confusion. It's a bit of a supremely postmodern sort of postulation, but it's like the, the idol that you know is false. You worship it anyway, because it gets you somewhere. Like, you know, the, the, the God that you actually know, it doesn't exist, but you, you look around and based on actually, ironically, another set of criteria, you're like, okay, but we're still going to do all of that mm-hmm. because it gets us these other things. And... But I guess I guess the issue is sort of you, you have to like you have to have that realization. This is a point that Hannah Arendt makes, which is that sort of this kind of like end of history thinking lends itself to a extreme form of utilitarianism that explains a lot of stuff like the Soviet Union and the Nazis and Maoist China, um, which is basically that like if you're trying to create the solution to all the problems and the world that will be created by the result of your actions will be the supreme and perfect world, like from the utilitarian ends justify the means perspective, well, the ends are infinitely good and therefore the means can be infinitely bad. And it's this kind of thinking that basically makes people capable of um, stuff like the oppression and mm-hmm. destruction of people on such a huge scale. But no one no one ever committed genocide out of like, oh, I just I'm a psychopath and I love killing people and I'm gonna like murder hundreds of thousands of them. Most of the people who did all this stuff were thought, had in their head some kind of construct which was like, this is good. This their good will come of this. And so we have to, there, there, I think there has to be an understanding of the falseness of the idols because the moment that you kind of accept like, okay, there's, you know, we're trying to create good by pursuing this goal, but we also know that this goal isn't perfect. In fact, it might not even be possible. Then all of a sudden it's like, well, how can you send thousands of people to camps when it might all be for nothing? Like, you know, then it, then it is just evil. Then you can't sustain in your head the idea that it might be good. I think this is where like there's, for me, this is the value of having a, a religious type consciousness, like some kind of North star within your field of experience that is not purely material. Some kind of like, to use the kind of Zizekian term, like a big other that is not something that can be achieved on this earth, like the communist paradise or like the perfect free market society which will always in some sense justify some kind of utilitarian logic in order to get there. And <laughs> no matter what gets flattened in the wave side, because the, 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 the ends justify the means. And this is the kind of like, again, the tricky point of, I think where we're at now, because 
religion up to the kind of the era of the rise of capitalism and the rise of the bourgeoisie was precisely what was used to legitimize the old forms of social relations, basically collection of wealth in the tiny hands of the aristocracy and the everybody else being peasants working the fields and the, mm. the like the bourgeois middle class were like no we've got a whole new system of philosophy we've got our utilitarianism we've got our scientism we've got our rationalism we've got the meritocracy that it informs that means that the people who are in charge don't have to just be the ones who are mandated to be there by god we have the power ourselves to create our own destiny and to create and improve society and to use our science to create institutions like medicine and like 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 seriously powerful engineering like the work of fucking brunel building stupid ships and massive bridges which are fucking bad ass but i think now we reach the point where we're kind of at the limits of what that type of consciousness what that type of relating to the world can achieve kind of like most explicitly exemplified in things like the soviet union i think the the tricky thing that often doesn't get appreciated is like liberalism and communism are both products of the same joining point in history if it was just like the like the the communist theorists the socialist theorists were just the radicals who were like you know what like liberalism doesn't have enough space for us within it and I think that the question now is like, how is there some kind of rehabilitation of a religious consciousness that enables the, the human subject to experience its locus of identity, not primarily orientated to something material, and thus that can be achieved by its own pure rationality. But to do that without lapsing into some kind of pre-modern medievalistic legitimation of a kind of immortal power elite. Like what I would hate, for example, is a religious priesthood of silicon valley here's the thing here's the thing um there's a reason why i like accelerationism more and more whether positive or negative or whatever because it's just that embracing of the um motion right it's about continuing that motion the other day i was thinking about how china has existed for like you know it was a few millennia before christ there was already china there was already a civilization there and there were if you look at you know, the map of the kingdoms in a time lapse and of like compressed time. It looks like an organism expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. And it's been happening for like 3000 or, or 5000 years. And, and they understand that it's with cycles. It comes and goes. There's like, uh, it's, it's, you know, there's peaks of imperial expansion of power. And then there's moments of depression and of oppression and of poverty and of uh, colonization by external forces. America and by and the West are 300 years old. And though the West had a history before that, at this point, it matters very little. So it still has like that naivete of, of, of thinking, you know, this, the Enlightenment project has this naivete of it's going to be upwards forever. And what accelerationism kind of embraces the fact that, you know, mobilism is eternal and it might crash, it might continue, it might whatever, but it will continue to move. And so that's why Dugan has, some, uh, you know, this comparison between China and, and the Enlightenment West makes Dugan become even more relevant. So what he's trying to do is to tie Russia not to the Enlightenment project of the Soviet Union, which is, was this, this rationalistic uh, Marxist type project, but tie it back to something else, tradition with a big T, to the Mongol expansion, to this ancient thing of the people, right? The, 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 he, you remember he spoke about the contraction and the expansion of the territory of Russia. And he, I, I guess that his point with saying this is that there is a contraction and an expansion and uh, so far the west does not admit for that and and it's theology it's only expansion whereas accelerationism and mobilism might have to teach us that yes there will be a contraction and a transition and you know if you look back in history that happens everywhere all the time forever and i think it's mm. notable to bring that in also in how we formulate and think about these theologies. I guess the contraction would make the theology all the more important because at least while we continue to expand, while every year we reach a newer height of technology, like our faith in ourselves as merely just being capable of this awesome and supreme superiority 
it's continually reinforced. And then when there is a contraction, it is viewed as a disaster. And in a way, it might help a lot to have a view of the universe that sort of involves placing you in a wider context than simply like you are ascending a flight of stairs as part of a collective that, that gives meaning to existence beyond just more, like, which I think is kind of the overriding way that we really live our lives now. It's just about more, acquire more, know more, be more. Or a philosophy of defeat. Mm. Um, of acknowledging of hibernation and rest and sleep in winter. Mm. It feels there is this nice graph that you know peak oil and peak America they coincide. Mm. They coincide in two thousand with the Matrix the last moment before AGI began to be born. And right now we're kind of in denial, but you know, reality yeah. snaps back always. So that's why, you know, there's not, it's not like we have a choice. It's not like we have, we can contemplate, but there's no going back. There's really very little agency other than embracing the tide and moving with it. So that's why, you know, for all its ills, there's this Portuguese guy called Agostinho da Silva and he talks about, um, you know, acknowledging that capitalism can morph into something else in the deep future. And he says that in a positive tone, mm. you know, it's not like we have a choice, but to accept that. Yeah. But this is like this kind of thinking to a lot of people and institutions in our society is like, the highest heresy the idea that there is that actually like you know this this is not the ultimate system it will continue to change as all systems do like it kind of to the to the people who built the system who invested so much in the system there's a bit of a reaction i think of like well what was the point then but there's two things there which is <laughs> It's like that thing with the men's movement that Chris Gabriel said, which is like, if you're a man, you don't need no one's permission to be one. It's like, um, if you truly have the power that is blessed by the real and by being appropriately adequate to reality, then it doesn't matter the reaction of older institutions who don't want to budge. They will adapt or perish. And that's, that's the way that things flow, right? Um, yeah the real is the edge of the spear is more at the vanguard than current institutions. And uh, we know that they fall or they adapt. That's, that's the way of things, I guess. Well, I think institutions are kind of constructed initially to expand, but there's an inherent conservatism in institutions because like to construct an institution is like basically this idea, like, we've got a certain way of doing things. We need more of this way of doing things. So like let's build loads of hospitals and medical schools so that we can scale up medical science and treat ideally the entire population with medicine. And on the one side of the coin, it's like, well, yeah, that sounds like a really fucking good idea. You reduce arbitrary human suffering. But on the other side of the coin, it, It produces, this is what it comes down to, it produces its own problems. It produces the kind of like drive to medicalize everything. Every problem can be medicalized and thus found a solution to. And this is at the point where we're at now, where I think medicine turns its attention increasingly, not just to problems of the body as like a biochemical structural system, but of the mind of the psyche and then attempts to find solutions to it short solutions to it in the same way it finds solutions to the problem of the body solutions with pills solutions with short six week mindfulness or what's the word cognitive behavioral therapy treatments and then you're supposed to go forth and be like a 
a functioning human subject again. There's something that, that Alexander Bard says, which I, which I quite like. It's like the problem with psychotherapy as opposed to psychoanalysis, or and you can even say the entire psychiatric establishment is that its purpose is to renormalize subjects. There's no critical element in the, the kind of underlying assumption of the psychiatric establishment is that society is as it should be and people should be made to fit into the box of society mm. another example would be the education system it's like it would probably seem completely absurd to our ancestors if you said right what we're going to do is we're going to take all the kids and then we're going to draw this line around them so all of the kids that were born within a single year they now exist as like a, a structural or sociological entity and we're going to put them in a room, just like a four walled room with one adult and make them sit at a desk all day and just do like mathematics and then do literacy and then do other stuff and like give them this every day, Monday to Friday, a bit of break time, very little interaction with, with their elders or with even the kids that are a few years older than them. Our answers would be like, bro, what? <laughs> but that's what we do. And then when the kids don't fit that structure, we feed them pills. We feed them Ritalin increasingly. So it's like yeah. a whole fucking massive thing in the States at the moment, medicating kids for this condition like ADHD that's conveniently been invented or discovered to describe how kids don't fit into this quite artificial structure that I've just, just outlined. Mm. That's why we live in the age of the innovation consultant, which is this snake skin shatter facilitator for institutions to actually adapt and move on. But, you know, the good ones are almost shamanic. They're almost like witch doctors because to change an inner way of working of a society is akin to doing that to an individual, which is kind of a very psychedelic transformative experience ridden with chaos. And that's also why we idolize the likes of Elon Musk above every uh, one else who can fit the archetype of the hero, right? Because... Mm, what his task symbolizes and so many others do symbolize is this transition of uh, older systems and breaking them down and reassembling them anew because that's necessary. And again, tying that back to, to how things have to become continually, right? They have to, it's the cycles of the year, it's the leaves and the trees and it's the people in the institutions. There's no way around it. Mm. And like, it's, it's sort of a manifestation of society's attempts to reproduce a better version of itself. It's sort of like the reason, like it, 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 the reason that we have like X or Y problems, it's only because of stuff that falls outside of the system. And if we were just better at just slotting everything into the system and finding newer and better ways of making everyone sort of conform, yeah. then, then the problems would go away. And yeah, and it's, it's, I think it's almost, in, as it exists now, it's almost kind of a symptom of modernism. Like previous, every society reproduces itself. And probably everyone in every society could agree that ideally they'd like to reproduce a better society, but ultimately like pe peasant society doesn't like need this colossal establishment to reproduce itself. You're a peasant, you don't farm, you die. If you don't teach your kids how to farm, they die. <laughs> it's simple. And there's other aspects of culture that you do end up reproducing, but it's not you know, whereas now we've taken the sort of more modern, like, attitude of measurable, technical sort of batch production of children, put them on the conveyor belt, measure them with the tests, and they don't fit, then try and change them until they do, in order to produce, like, ultimately, you know, the sort of ideal student and the you know and the same i think this 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 strikes me as very similar to a lot of stuff that michelle foucault says um i think most most damningly in regards to sort of mental health where he points out that 
in medieval society, like someone being crazy was not like, you know, it was recognized like this is not an ideal way to be. But the idea of like making someone uncrazy was, you know, not really existent. If someone went mad, it's because God wants them to be mad. And actually, a lot of the, you know, they had this idea of like the holy fool. A lot of people who were obviously suffering from mental disabilities were kind of viewed as like actually a bit sacred and being a bit more in touch with God in a lot of ways. And, you know, there was you know, even a bit of value seen in that, or at least generally, it, like it was just viewed as an attribute that someone has. Whereas now it's like we have to beat it out of you. Yeah. You have to stop being having ADHD, you have to like, you know, even even stuff that's like intrinsic and obviously bad, like sort of schizophrenia, it might be like, well, why would you not want to cure, cure schizophrenia? And it's like, well, you know, back in, in, in other societies, they just didn't stress about it. They just built their society in a way where that wouldn't be too big of an issue. Whereas like now we actually stress more over this because we think we can make it go away because we think we have control because the perfect mm -hmm. society would have control and would be able to make it go away. And we have to endeavor for that. I think when you solve a problem at a level, it will reappear at another level. It's the old saying that there's always a snake in the garden. Mm. And, you know, an example, a while ago I was cold in my feet. So I put on some socks. So what does this mean? The real fluctuates and humans adapt to it. Mm. To have the hubris of modernity to say, no, 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 the real is fixed and static and let's, there's a way to solve it and we've solved it and that's it. And that's not the right way to go because as we know, modernity has solved a fuckload of things, but you know, there's problems reemerge in other places and with the rage if we're not smart enough. So what you understand when you're living in the wilderness or what the peasants of ancient times understood when they were farming is that they adapt to a mobile reel in the winter you do certain things in the summer you do certain other things because the reel fluctuates and late modernity kind of is blind and in, in denial to the fact that the reel does fluctuate um, and it wants to standardize it always forever whether it is to ban mental disease or to invent a communist paradise or to invent a universal basic income with a meritocracy that will solve things forever like a platonist uh fantasy of pharaoh kings not pharaoh kings philosopher kings i don't know it just sounds weird you have to act it's, it's shit changes man it's what the psychedelic witch doctor knows this is like a an institutional outlawing of suffering. I mean, look, like life is pretty fucking brutal and being miserable, experiencing like dread or self-hatred or deep despair is awful. In say Christian society, what do you do? You go into like the most beautiful, the most sacred building that exists and you see emblazoned at the back of it, the depiction of the best man ever being fucking crucified. It's yeah. like you can't get away from suffering. Like suffering is the core cool symbol of the culture. What does it mean to be a cold, miserable, starving peasant, but to know that that symbol is what ties you to everybody else? Well, it means that your suffering is not just some isolated problem that you need to get rid of. Your suffering is in some way something that ties you to your community. Unfortunately, it also is a powerful weapon against social revolution because it's like, oh, well, you know what? This is just the way it is. We've got to suffer. So yeah. I don't believe the answer is just a kind of a Christian revival of replacing <laughs> institutional solutions to problems with a Jesus suffered too, bra. Yeah. But there is a wisdom in that stance that yeah. we lose when every single iteration of suffering is just an individualized problem that needs to be fixed. Mm. I think this is most epitomized in the modernist attitude towards death, or more specifically, um, the lack of an attitude towards death. I, one of my favorite things to do when I worked at the pub in London was 
the OS people, they'd come in, they'd be like, um, can I have a pint of beer? I'd be like, yeah, sure. And I'd start pouring the pint of beer. And then I'd say, so what do you reckon happens after we die? And like 80% of people, I mean, A, it's funny because everyone's a bit like, whoa, what? And then like, which is initially interesting because it's like, they're surprised that someone would ever even ask them that question. And it's like, why not? Like, you're a human. You are inevitably going to die. Have you not thought about this at some point? Has someone you know not died at some point? So but then secondly, the in it's funny, in like in some cases you get a pretty quick response. Some people are just like, ah, oh, yeah, I believe in reincarnation, or oh yeah, I believe we go to heaven. But um 80% of cases, they'd actually have to think about it for a bit, and then they'd be like, no, I reckon. I reckon nothing happens. And so I'd be like, so you're saying we just switch off like a computer? And they're like, yeah. And like, I think this is not a good attitude to have towards death because like if you're trying to, I think it comes from trying to like logically work out like what happens to the human experience after death. And the logical thing is like nothing, that's the end of the human experience. But this isn't, like this isn't a, this isn't a good attitude because then ultimately you end up with well you know what does science and modernism have to tell you science and modernism only has to tell you like ah oh, medicine had been a bit better they wouldn't have died so the only thing death ultimately is just a failure it's just like ah oh, they should have been saved like this is it is a medical condition that one day we will be able to cure like every other medical condition and. So ultimately, all there is is tragedy because the system has fucked up because this person should have not died and said they died because we weren't sufficiently perfect. We have, we aren't yet. Like you know, they didn't live long enough to experience us reaching the goal of there being no medical, like you know, no arbitrary suffering, and therefore, like now, everyone has to arbitrarily suffer. Whereas, like actually, if you look at it, like people are pretty willing and able to deal with suffering if they believe it's for a reason, if they believe there's a good reason for it. Like, even the obvious one is, like, just to make money. I think an obvious example would be I, I went tree planting and, like, it's, it's one of the most – I think the, the word that sums it up best is just, like, uncomfortable. It's just permanent discomfort. Like, there's – like, when you're doing really well and you're thinking, like, yes, I'm doing really well, I'm making a lot of money – the discomfort takes a back seat, but it's never gone. You're just never, ever comfortable. At no point in the job are you like, oh, this is nice, this is easy. Because ultimately, if it's easy, that's just because you're not trying hard enough and you're not making as much money as you could be making. But because in the back of your mind, you're like, oh, but there's a wider reason for this. I'm making money. This is going to benefit me in the long run. You're totally willing to put yourself through a horrific discomfort, stand out in the pouring, freezing rain or in the blazing sun, sweating your ass off. Like, climbing through thickets and getting bitten by insects. And so people are capable of dealing with suffering. They need meaning. They need higher purpose to deal with that suffering. Like we look at all these men who went over the top in World War I and we view them as heroes who died for their country. And it's kind of like, well, without the World War I, all of their deaths would have been a tragedy. But at least with the war, we have this kind of like, oh, there was a higher purpose or like, you know, the men who went ashore at D-Day and died. It's like they died to defeat fascism. And it's like, how much nicer is that to think about when someone died than like, oh, we couldn't cure his cancer. Sorry about that. So I, I, I think this is the big, one of the big failures of modernism is there's no method of dealing with death. Like death is just failure. It's just, it's just nothingness. It's just like, the, the manifest imperfection of our system. Whereas almost every other overarching worldview has some kind of like way of coping with death, essentially. Either they're in a better place, they've been reincarnated, or even just like that death had a purpose. Mm. What was the statistic you said, Dylan, the other day about like half of people don't believe their work contributes to the world? Oh, um, si upwards of 60% of the population, of, I believe the Netherlands, or it but it might be Denmark, but I think it's the Netherlands, don't actually believe that their job contributes to the economy or to society. 
I think it's just society. Right. It's like this is the like alienated modern postmodern condition. I think it's also yeah. articulated very much like in in climate like what would you say like ecological circle like i've heard my little sister say to me once it's like <laughs> humans were a parasite on the earth it's like well that that comes from a place where something in your own consciousness believes like i'm a parasite on the earth i just take out i don't give back hmm. <laughs> Daniel, you need to bounce in a sec. Yeah, I do. What do you guys reckon? Do you want to wrap it up in a sec? Yeah, I'm down. I think we've been going for like uh, more than an hour. So I think we've got, I think it's pretty, in terms of length of uh, podcast, I think it's pretty ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think we can wrap it up in a few would be nice to end on something other than the meaninglessness of death. Well, I think this is the thing that we're talking about, like death, I think is interesting because this isn't the first time recently that Daniel and I have had conversations to wind up at death quite frequent, in fact. And I think perhaps this is one of the great cultural, creative, philosophical rehabilitations we have to do is that we actually need to begin to theorize death seriously to actually like bring death back into consciousness as opposed to it being this kind of thing that the the rational scientific modernist consciousness knows happens but it just kind of wants to get rid of it Mm. it's like let's let's do our best to prevent death on the personal level let's do our best to prevent death on the societal level and let's do our best to not think about death. Let's put old people and sick people away in buildings where we don't have to look at them. Mm. Let's not take, there's something that's there's in that kind of individualistic society where rather than taking care of your very sick elderly relatives who lose the ability to care for themselves, you go and put them in a care home institution. Now that's in part precisely because the actual conditions of modern life make it difficult to care for them unless you've got someone who earns enough to, that you can have someone who stays at home and be a full-time carer. But still that very structure is baked into the foundation of our civilization where people basically take care of themselves and when they take, can't take care of themselves anymore an institution takes care of them so that those who are closest to them don't actually confront the imminence of that person's death and the imminence of their own death now i'm not saying that this is the the design principle of like care homes but it is nonetheless an effect mm, i think it's almost like even I, I'd say even it kind of is a design principle. It's just a subconscious design principle. Precisely, it, precisely. It wasn't in the front of the minds of the people who put it together, but the, the fact that it was like, oh, and this will mean that all these people will be over there instead of over here, like that appealed to them on a subconscious level. It was like, we'll take the problem of old age and decay and death and put that problem away. You know, and I think I think that's also got to do with the nuclear family as well. Ultimately, is that you know back in the day, like old people would live with their children until they died. That was that. Like there, there was no hospital, and so like you know you would literally be with your grandparents and your parents until their dying breath. It was part of your life. But now we've just decided, like, oh, we don't need that part of life anymore. Well, you're only going to live with your kids, with your parents, until you hit a certain age. That way. You'll never have to be around someone significantly older than you. And when they die, they'll do it in a hospital. Maybe you can go visit them. Hmm. Any final thoughts, Daniel? It's like these are responses to this, to these problems that are of the system. Like you said, they are of the paradigm of the nature of the exchanges of, of, money symbols and value that people engage in in modernity and it's also a symptom of how technology is the process through which one engages with that so what does technology imply that you don't have to accept the inevitabilities that you can hack at them and keep a certain state going on for longer artificially as opposed to accepting it's perishing i think that's the symptom of modernity and to be honest the fact that we're 
finishing so many conversations on this topic maybe means that um, it's time to put this baby down. And, you know what I mean? In terms of modernity and, and what's coming afterwards. And it is what it is. And nothing was meant to be forever. No, I mean, again, this brings me back to the point of like, it's time to rehabilitate some kind of religious worldview because religion is- Or let it die and, and let rehabilitation happen on its own accord. Maybe we don't have to do anything, maybe, you know? Because rehabilitation means kind of, you know, fix this to keep it going f- for longer. Maybe it, maybe it just has to die because cause it has to. With a big H, it has to. It's, it's but I, I, are. This is like another debate opening up. I think it's impossible to just let something die. Well, exactly. But, like as, as it of its own accord, it will do this. It will cycle back and forth. And we, all we can do is like have our antennas well tuned to the right moment and to the flows of the instant. Well, I think we are, we have a bit more of an influence than that. Like, I think, especially for a grand cultural phenomenon like this, like when it's death becomes inevitable. That is now a fixed, that is now a constant, but like the river flows, but where's it's, where it's going is still up for like the bit that we participated yeah, yeah. in not so much saving of the dying system, but the creation of the new one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. And so like, I guess that's, that's the room for creativity that death ironically provides that ultimately the fact that every system eventually dies. Mm-hmm gives us the room to make new ways of living. And it's kind of an essential part of freedom that ultimately, like we can't be free in a world with universal constants. There has to be constant change and everything that yep. is has to eventually be something that was. So otherwise we wouldn't be free. Holy agree. So maybe, that's, yeah. maybe that's the value of death. That's why the gods envy Hercules because he dies and therefore is free. Mm. Something yeah. like that. And the gods are stuck in Olympo being immortal desires, immortal artificial intelligences that have to be stuck in their drama forever and ever. Even the Titans are living, but bound in Tartarus. Mm. And that's and in um I think is it is it Tolkien? I believe like the great power of the men is their mortality. The fact that they know they will die drives them to build and to create and to expand, to achieve in their lifetimes because they know their time is finite. Whereas the elves are just, eventually they just sail away to this land of like kind of whateverness. They just lose interest in the world because they've just been around for too long. <laughs> whateverness <laughs> listen guys sounds uh, uh, to me like a good place to wrap it up it was a really good conversation I sadly I have to go um, but thank you so much yeah great great speaking to you it's uh, it's been good I think we've yes. uh, learned a lot it's been very fun good to be back good to meet I you as well it. and let's yeah. uh, let's do this again soon this is so cool seeing you guys together on my screen it's like oh look yeah I think Dylan if you like do you want to stay on the line a bit we can just like catch up and talk about some like random shit if Daniel you need to go yeah definitely we hope you enjoyed the show consider becoming our patron and helping us put out more content like this patreon.com forward slash techno social